Welcome everyone and um, thank you for coming to this evening's BMS talk. Um, I'm going to introduce our chair for this evening, Mark Ramsdale. Um, Mark is Associate Professor in Molecular Microbiology and Head of Training at the MRC Centre for Medical Mycology at the University of Exeter. Um, and he's also the chair of the BMS Fungal Education and Outreach Committee which included overseeing the planning of the recent UK Fungus Day. So, Mark, you're a busy man. <laughs> Over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. Um, it gave me enormous pleasure this evening to uh, introduce to you uh, three students who are studying fungal ecology, and actually just to welcome the audience because we have uh, participants from all over the globe um, from what I understand, we have participants in the US and uh, all the way across to India. So uh, welcome to whatever time zone you happen to be in. Um, today, we've got three speakers. We've got Mu Yao uh, Chi, we have Joette Crozier, and we have Nimzi Ka. They're going to talk about their uh, project work in fungal ecology. If during the uh, talks, you have any questions, then please post those into the chat. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat and be able to then relay those questions to the speakers after they've completed the talk. Each talk will be about 15 to 20 minutes long, so we should have about 10 minutes for questions afterwards. So I'd like to begin by introducing our first speaker this evening, and that's Mu Yao Chi. Uh, Mu Yao is a third year PhD student studying at Imperial College London and is also linked to the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew. Her project is focused on modelling the spectral distribution of ectomycorrhizal fungi in Europe and the response of ectomycorrhizal fungal distribution to climate change. Mu Yao is also interested in the impact of host plants on ectomycorrhizal fungal distributions. So the title of her talk this evening is Traits and Host Specificity Infer Different Distributions for Ectomycorrhizal Fungi. So over to you. Yes, let me share my screen now. So is that okay to see my screen? Yeah, no, that's we can't fine. see. We can't see your screen. Is that okay? okay. I can't see your screen, no. Oh, you, you can't see my screen? I can't, no. Okay, let me... Sorry. Yes. There we are. <laughs> Thank you. So now it, it works. Yes, it does. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to talk Sorry, about- Sorry, Muyao, you yeah. might need to um, swap your display so that you can just show the, the slides. At the moment, we've got your notes as well as your slides. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, let me try to turn this. Is that okay? If you go to the top. Yeah. Left. Yeah. And normally, Use slideshow. slideshow. Okay, yeah. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to talk about my some of my results. Uh, the title of my presentation is Trees and Host Specificity in for Different Distributions for Ectomacrazal Fungi. So before I start talk about the results, let's talk about the two titles here. Ectomacrazal fungi and uh, species distribution. Uh, Ectomacrazal fungi, uh, that's the macrazal fungi can form symbiotic relationships with plant roots. 
They are the dominant mycorrhizas in temperate and uh, mycorrhizal fungi in temperate and some tropical forests. They can provide nutrition to about 30% of all tree stems on Earth and play a crucial role in global carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycling. However, these fungi are threatened by global change and their conservation is overlooked. A species distribution is the range of resources and the natural factors over space. In this space, a species can live and maintain a variable population. So studying species distribution can help people understand the living range of species and establish protected areas for endangered ones. Typically, there are three data sources used in ectomycorrhizal studies. Uh, there are food bodies, including the above ground mushrooms and the below ground truffles and the ectomycorrhizas, and also the soil. They are the black part here in the, in the figure. However, the above and the below ground data hardly align. For example, some fungi dominant below ground mycorrhizal communities, but do not fruit above ground like truffles, and uh, some fungi fruit abundantly, but form few mycorrhizas like amanita. So here are two questions for the actual mycorrhizal fungal distributions. What data sources should be used in simulating ectomycorrhizal fungal distribution? And uh, what is the influence of host plants on ectomycorrhizal fungal distributions? To answer the first, first question, I estimated the environmental niche for ectomycorrhizal fungi uh, used two data sources. Here, the ectomycorrhizal fungi were grouped into conspicuous and the inconspicuous species. The conspicuous species are those species producing mushrooms and the inconspicuous species are those producing crusts, truffles, sclerotia, and sclerotia. For the second question, I modeled the geographical distribution for broadleaf specialists, conifer specialists, and the host generalists. In environmental niche modeling, I selected 66 ectomycorrhizal fungal species uh, based on the ectomycorrhizal data set from Wanderland 2018. In this, uh, in the ectomycorrhizal fungal data set, uh, each OTU was was uh, represent a species and uh, uh, and identified to the UNET database. The two data sources here are food body data downloaded from GBIF and the Pluto IF API. The Pluto IF API stores the data from the UNET database, and the root data are from the ectomycorrhizal data set I mentioned before. And also, six environmental variables, including three climate variables, were downloaded from. Chersa database and the three soil variables were downloaded from soil grids used in the niche modeling. The six environmental variables are mean annual air temperature, isothermality, precipitation, seasonality, soil nitrogen, soil pH, and the soil organic carbon stock. Uh, this graph shows uh, is the representation of the niche overlap on for the first two axes of a PCA. The yellow parts are the entire, uh, entire niche of food body data, and the blue part is the entire niche of root data. The shadow are the uh, overlap niche between the food body and the root data niches. The black and the white points represent the species occurrences for each data, uh, each data source. Uh, in this graph, we can see the first one is shows the contribution of the each environmental variables along the first two axes of a PCA. We can see here the organic carbon stock contributed most to the niche modeling among all the environmental variables. 
and the B to D are three examples for the niche overlap uh, between fruit body and root, root data niches. B is Rushla nobilis. It is a conspicuous species and has the highest niche overlap in the study. And the D shows the lowest niche overlap. Uh, C shows the lowest niche overlap and the D shows the uh, niche overlap with D value equals to 0 0.5. Here, the D value is used to assess the niche overlap range, ranges ranging from 0 to 1. 0 means uh, no niche overlap and the 1 means totally overlapping of two niches. Then I compared, uh, I, I checked the niche overlap for all species. We can see in the study species, most of them have low niche overlap and their niche overlap values are lower, low than 0 0.5. Here, the red points represent the conspicuous species and the black points represent inconspicuous species. After that, I compared the niche area and the niche density between fruit body and the root data niches for conspicuous and the inconspicuous species. We can see here uh, the fruit body data niche area is significantly larger than the niche area of root data for conspicuous species. However, the, there is no difference differences between fruit body, uh, be, there is no differences of niche area and the niche density between fruit body and the root data niches for inconspicuous species. Actually, in this study, the number of uh, root fruit body data uh, is five to 10 times than the number of root data. So this results re um, reflects uh, Root data can contribute more to the niche modeling for inconspicuous species than for conspicuous species, as it can model as good niche as the foot body data did. Based on the results of uh, niche modeling, I used the SIM 66 ectomicrazole fung fungal species with the both fruit body and the root data in the geographical distribution modeling. And I kept the same environmental variables. That means the three same climate variables and the three same in, uh, soil variables. Besides these six environmental variables, I also modeled the current distributions of host plants. The host plants, uh, are uh, beech, sessile, and uh, pendiculate oak, scots pine, and the Norway spruce, and uh, three climate variables and uh, two soil variables are also used in, model in modeling the host plants distribution. So in the uh, species distri geographical distribution modeling, there are two kinds of model used in the analysis. One I called e-model, it only used the six environmental variables and the ectomacrazo fungal species occurrences. And the other one is, I called EH model, it added the host plants distribution to the e-model. These two kinds of model are all e-symbol model based on four algorithms, including GLM, GBM, random forest, and the MaxInt. Then I compared these two kinds of model in the following four aspects. There are evaluation scores of model, the importance of variables, the shift of distribution, distribution centuries, and the, the changes of distribution area. So in this graph, we can see the comparison of evaluation scores. The left one shows the results, the evaluation scores from EH model. We can see there are only four species that cannot produce a symbol model, and the two species had a low evaluation, low evaluation scores that 
means this six species cannot be used in the future analysis, but the right one, we can see only 32 species that can produce the valid uh, e-symbol model used in the future analysis. Then these 32 species were, uh, were used in the future analysis, including the comparison of variables importance, the shift of uh, distribution centuries, the changes of distribution area. So in these uh, graphs, we can see the housed plants contributed more in the distribution modeling of ectomycorrhizal fungi. And at the same time, the climate variables com contributed less in the EH model than that in the E model. This may reflect the how the climate variables will influence the ectomycorrhizal fungal distribution where there are host plants. And then I uh, mapped uh, the centuries from E model and the EH model in a same uh, in a same map. Here we can see the blue points are the centuries from E model and the red points are the centuries from EH model. Uh, we can see when adding the host plants uh, information, the distribution centuries move to the northwest. And also this map shows the distribution based on the species uh, host specificity. The circles here represent the broadleaf specialists. The triangles represent the conifer specialists and the squares represent the generalists. We can see conifer specialists lived in the north or two of the broadleaf specialists and the generalists. This may be uh, caused by the host, the centuries of host plants distribution. In this map, I add the centuries of host distribution. Uh, they are the black points here. We, we can see the conifer, coniferal plants uh, lived in the north of Europe and the broadleaf plants uh, lived in to the west to the centuries that uh, without host plants information. And at last I uh, compared the I compared the, the area changes for the broadleaf specialists, conifer specialists, and the host generalists. Here, I used the numbers of distribution groups groups to represent the area changes, and the, the area change uh, uh, is the area of EH model minus the area of E model. Here we can see when adding the host plants information, most species have a smaller distribution area, especially for the conifer specialists, as all of them, the distribution area dec decreased. Uh, this may reflect the host distribu uh, the host plants would restrict the distribution area for ectomycorrhizal fungi. So in summary, uh, the fruit body and the root data infer different environmental niche for conspicuous and uh, inconspicuous ectomycorrhizal fungal species. Uh, root data are important for estimating the environmental niche of fungi with inconspicuous fruit bodies. Host plants information can enhance the performance of models and uh, the distributions of ectomycorrhizal fungi will be restricted by their host plants. So we suggest that um, more root data should be used in the future studies of ectomycorrhizal fungal distribution, especially for the fungi that form inconspicuous uh, fruit bodies. And uh, a root data set, the establishment of root data set is essential 
And also we should consider the host plants, uh, uh, consider the host plants should be used as a predictor in the modeling of ectomycorrhizal fungi. And at last, I would like to thank my supervisors, Martin, Carolina, Laura, and David, and uh, my colleagues, Guillaume and Sears, for their guidance, cooperation, and support. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mu Yao. That was a fascinating talk. Um, there are some questions starting to appear in the chat. If anybody does have any questions, please uh, can you post them up uh, now? I'd like to just kick off by asking you about the influence of the uh, frequency with which different species are reported in different environments. Um, you've obviously got coniferous forests in the north, in Sweden, in Norway, and in Finland. Um, and then you've got lots of broad-leaved trees and forests further south. Um, does the, the Do the relationships that you are detecting depend at all upon the frequency with which mycologists are visiting those particular sites? Uh, actually, no, I didn't uh, calculate it, but I think this, this may... Uh, we need more host, uh, I mean, host plants information here because we only use five species here, but there may be, there are still other host plants, I mean, in the forest that we, we didn't collect the data. Okay, okay. Um, some questions that have come up. So this is from Gemma. Uh, can Gemma ask if the modeling was done uh, without any field work or were these inferred niches tested in the field? So two, two different questions, I suppose. Uh, for the first question, uh, for me, there is no field uh, work, but the root data, I mean, that's from the actual macro data set is uh, from the field work that's who is my colleague says he collected the data from the ICP forests. Okay, and the related question was, were these inferred niches tested in the field? Actually, no, that may be the future work I can do to test uh, whether my results uh, match the actual facts. Okay. Um, I have another question just to give other people time to put some some into the chat as well. Um, you've mentioned conspicuous fungi, and I, I get that. Inconspicuous fungi, crusts, formers, subterranean species, I suppose, might be inconspicuous. Is there any plan to cover hidden fungi, as in, you know, using molecular techniques, for example, to look at these relationships? Sorry, could you repeat that last sentence? So you've mentioned conspicuous fungi. Yeah. So you can see big, big, juicy fruit bodies. You've yeah. mentioned the inconspicuous ones, which are the, you know, the crusts and the um, truffles, for example, which would be subterranean. But is there any plan to incorporate molecular data on species diversity, fungal ectomycorrhizal species that you perhaps aren't picking up through direct observations of fruit bodies and linking that into the data at all? Oh, uh, I'd like to say, no, I didn't use that. Yeah, so. Okay, one one final question then. Uh, yeah. This is from Eric. Uh, would you not expect root data to dominate for inconspicuous species whose fruit bodies would be recorded less frequently? Yes, I. That's maybe a may, maybe a reason, but you know, even they have the less frequency in the 
the GBIF. They also have the less frequency in the in the root data set. So I, I think the uh the percentage between the of the root data to the GBIF data are similar to the conspicuous and the inconspicuous species. That means even the the less frequency of the inconspicuous species, this it still can uh, reflect the contribution of the root data. Is, is that clear? <laughs> No, that's, that's great. Thank you. A few other comments just saying a really great and really interesting talk, Mu Yao. Um, and I think one person said that this directly relates to something that one of their students is doing. So um, maybe you'll be able to look at the chat later and, and, and see okay. who that is. So that's yeah. great. Thank you very much. Yes, thank um, you. I can give you a round of applause. Thank you. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker for this evening, uh, and that is Joette Crozier. Um, Joette is uh, currently in the US. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, Joette is part of the Natural Resources Institute uh, and uh, is at the University of Helsinki, or at least that they are overseeing her PhD studies. She is a conservation mycologist, uh, currently conducting her doctoral research within the uh, Natural Resources Institute in Finland. Her background is in fungal ecology and evolutionary bio biology, and whilst working as a lab manager at a fungal biotech company, she was inspired about ways to improve the methodology for conservation of wood inhabiting fungi, and began that research in 2022. Her research interests include species conservation, rewilding, habitat restoration, and mycoremediation. And the title of her talk this evening is The Reintroduction of Threatened Wood Inhabiting Fungi. You, Joette. Thank you, Mark. I will share my screen now. Okay. Is that visible and nice? Yeah, that's very clear. Thank you. Great. Okay, yes. Yeah, so I'll be talking about my current project. Um, yes, yeah, so the reintroduction of threatened uh, wood inhabiting fungi through inoculation and translocation. In general, reintroduction work with fungi is relatively new and has not been done very often. Uh, so I'm just working on methodology that makes it kind of feasible to implement at scale. Uh, before I get into the details of my project, give a little bit of background on fungal conservation and the history of that and why it's so important. Um, so this is a graphic from the red listing. Uh, as you see, fungi has historically been underrepresented in red list assessment, um, but it has come a long way in the last it, seven years. Um, now it's getting a lot more in, uh, attention. And of course, this is important. Uh, because the red lists are used to inform conservation decisions to uh, maybe decide where funding goes. So it's important that we understand the actual risks uh, towards fungi. Uh, from what they do know from assessments, uh, fungi are in decline um, in a lot of places uh, due to similar threats to a lot of other taxon. So one of the biggest threats is habitat loss uh, and habitat fragmentation. Um, it used to be widely accepted that fungi was not as affected by fragmentation because of the idea that spores can easily go everywhere. Now we know that that's not true. Um, in fact, most, the vast majority of spores go within a few meters to 100 meters, um, not very far. So a habitat fragmented landscape like this, which is very common in Finland and Sweden where I'm working, uh, you can see there's little patches of healthy forest but there's a lot in the way to from agriculture to urbanization and um, that massively affects the ability of the fungi to jump from one habitat to one which might be suitable for them, um, but they can't really get there on their own. So one study I did a couple of years ago found that there was already a five-fold reduction in fungal DNA abundance that took place um, both in air and soil DNA collections between the forest and one kilometer distance towards the urban environment. Um, so that is where reintroduction comes into play. So there's a habitat that's suitable for the fungi. They used to exist there. And now, due to whatever reasons, they've gone locally extinct. 
and we can bring them back if it's the right decision. So let's talk about how you know if it's the right decision. Um, choosing fungi for conservation. Um, first, you have to ask, should you do the reintroduction work? And that has different considerations from, there's controversy over some species being important indicators, telling you how valuable a habitat is, and you need to make sure that your reintroduction work is very well documented. So it's known whether this is a naturally occurring species or has been reintroduced. Um, beyond that, uh, we also need to consider whether that specific species is a good candidate. And that has um, questions like, do we know the historical range? If you're in an area where the fungi hasn't been studied for a long time and you don't know the ecology uh, and the history, you can't really say that um, that it should be reintroduced because maybe it's just rare. Many, many species are rare and it's not a goal to make rare species common, uh, but just to bring back the ones that well, should be there um, based on what we know. So that also brings in the question, has it been red listed? Is it known that it is declining? If yes, and you start thinking uh, more about the fungi, you also so have to consider that strains matter. So you want um, genetic strains or individuals of that species which are from the region uh, so that you are not spreading genes from the other side of the world and that you can feel more confident that they're going to survive in that climate where you're doing the reintroduction. Um, and then again about genetic diversity, um, you want to make sure that what you reintroduce is not one strain, one individual that you put everywhere, uh, but a variety so that it does allow for future adaptation through sexual reproduction and evolution, because we don't know how the habitats will look in the future. So the fungi should be um, well suited to uh, do what they need to do to survive. And then there's also spawn considerations. So um, conservation researchers uh, might be thinking, how do they get the spawn, the starter mycelium that they use for introductions? Um, if you're considering whether you want to collaborate with a uh, industrial mushroom producer, for example, uh, there's a lot of considerations. Is it the right type of spawn to work with your tools? Are they using the right strains? Um, so spawn production is a whole other issue, but I will get into that as that's a big part of my project. So we found the species that we want to use for reintroduction in my project, which is in um, through Finland and Sweden. These are seven species which occur in both countries, um, pretty much the whole range um, from north to south, and have all been red list assessed, and they're known to be uh, different categories from vulnerable to critically uh, endangered. And I won't list off all the species. If you happen to know some of these and care about them, then we can talk about that later. But just to say that we have a variety uh, of different polypores, crust fungi, and we tried to represent different tree hosts, uh, spruce, pine, aspen, and one species that grows on living willow trees. So the rest are on deadwood, and this is on live trees. Um, yeah, so I said, my main interest is developing an approach that works for many species, which can be adapted depending on where you're doing the work and with what species you're working. So these are the species uh, that we're modeling that are important for Finland and Sweden, but the main focus is the methodology. So to get into that, um, this is, well, this is shiitake mushroom. This is not what we're doing, but just to uh, show that production of mushrooms um, has been happening for hundreds of years, growing on logs. And this methodology has been really well developed to be cost effective and uh, make inoculations easy. Um, but the few studies that have been done on fungal reintroduction to date have all used different methodology from each other and not really based on the best current mycological practices, but more decided on a project by project basis, which is mostly suitable for small research scale. Um, so that's, yeah, that's how I was inspired was how can we use um, contemporary methods and apply it to conservation? So for my project, there is a three-stage approach. Um, first, we started in the lab because already some of these species are quite tricky uh, in the lab. Um, 
not so good survival or growth rates sometimes. So first you need to make sure you can grow it well enough to get the spawn to use. Then we have the farm phase, uh, which looks like an edible mushroom farm in a way, where we're growing them on these small one meter logs and we can uh, maintain and check them for success. And then we also have the forest phase where at different time points, these um, inoculated logs are transferred to protected forest habitats in our range. And I will go into more detail on each of these points now. So in the lab phase, uh, this has all been done. Uh, so we have, I think this is on a previous slide, but we have five strains of each species. Um, and we tested those different strains on a variety of conditions. So first with the petri dishes, um, a really basic malt yeast auger versus a more complex one, because um, if fungi is grown on really simple uh, substrates, they kind of lose their viability or um, stop producing certain enzymes and don't transfer so well to the next stages. And we also tested temperature um, to try to find the minimum, maximum, and uh, ideal temperature for the species and then the strains individually. Uh, then grain. So grain is usually the in-between spawn. Um, they go from petri dish to grain to final spawn, which um, in this case I'm talking about sawdust. Uh, and we tested different compositions that look at um, moisture versus structure and air. Um, how much oxygen and CO2 exchange are they allowed to have, all of which impacts the fungi's ability to grow. And then we tested on sawdust. We wanted to use a couple different wood types. And this is, again, to get at that question of what's most cost effective and feasible. Um, in previous studies, it's been kind of assumed that if a fungi is found on pine, then they use a pine sawdust for the spawn. Um, but that can be really expensive uh, and hard to find if you find it at all. So in this case, we're testing birch, which is widely available in Finland and relatively quite cheap. Um, so far, they all at least grow on birch. Haven't run the analysis yet to see how well, <laughs> but they work for our purposes so far. Um, and then, yeah, testing uh, different conditions with the sawdust. We also looked at dowels. This is another way that logs can be inoculated. So you can either put the sawdust directly into the logs or you can put these little wooden pegs. Um, again, we tried different wood types and put them on a petri dish to see do they colonize and at the right speed. And we'll test uh, ergosterol to see do they have um, significantly different amounts of mycelium inside the different wood types. Okay, then on to the inoculation. Um, so. We've had these logs collected for us by uh, through thinnings with the forestry companies. Um, we're thinning these trees, so we kind of repurposed them for this uh, fungal reintroduction work. And for every strain, we had a variety of different logs. If you look in this picture, um, each stack is a strain or an individual um, of that fungi, and they are inoculated on their host tree, which, as I mentioned earlier, they have different natural hosts. So pine or spruce. Um, for the pine and spruce, we also did the slow grown or kello, which is a really rare type of wood um, shown in the picture on the bottom right, um, where they're naturally found. But of course, if they can grow on something less special and rare, then that's great. Um, so we're testing that. Uh, we inoculated, yeah, like I said, half with sawdust spawn and half with dowels to compare. Dowels are Again, the more expensive option, a little bit slower to use, um, traditionally used in this work, but if we can replace it with sawdust, it makes it more feasible. And then at the top, there's a diagram showing how it looks like. So first we drill all of those holes and fill it full with mycelium so that the log is uh, has mass amounts of fungi inside, giving them a better chance to connect with each other and survive. Then, we have the forest phase. So um, this kind of talks about the different time points that I mentioned. Right now we have farms in Southern Finland and in Southern Sweden. And we did the inoculation work in the spring and we immediately moved 33% out to the forest. Um, then we kept the rest on the farm for now. We will move another 
33% of the logs to the forests in um, next spring, and then we'll keep the rest on the farm for monitoring. So this kind of sees, uh, it doesn't really help to have them there on the farm where you can provide moisture and maintenance and they're a bit more isolated from the diversity that's in the final forest site. So um, maybe less or different contamination, we'll see. Um, yeah, and then that shows a map of all of uh, the points where we're translocating them. So all of those are protected forests, um, not in pristine condition, because if it's uh, really a pristine forest habitat, probably there's no need to do this sort of work. But if they're uh, previously been in management and there's not very much dead wood and um, it doesn't have a history or a recent history of these species occurring there because they've gone extinct with the with the forestry management practices locally extinct then that's our ideal habitat so then we um, take the logs out and you can see covers quite a range from the south to the north uh, we'll also look to see if um, different strains have an impact from local climate <laughs> Uh, yes, and then inoculation of the live tree. So this species I mentioned earlier, it's a dreadful picture, sorry, <laughs> as you know, um, those were uh, also tested on deadwood just to see if they could possibly make a fruit body so that you don't inoculate living trees. Um, but then we also inoculated living trees. So we'll compare how they do, but this is how they're naturally found. And um, for the forest, you just need to consider that there is a uh, suitable population of the trees available. So um, continuity, young ones, old ones, dead ones, and that it will keep coming so that the fungi can persist into the future. Uh, data and follow-up. So I talked a little bit about the lab data we're already collecting and analyzing, but for the logs, we will take uh, sawdust of the logs after a couple of years of growth. We'll test the DNA to see the relative abundance of our target species versus um, contamination other species to get an idea of how far that they've spread. Um, and that's one measure of success. Uh, oh yeah, and then I mentioned we're also uh, have some data from a previous project of one of my supervisors where the species were inoculated directly into natural logs that were just fallen in the forest. So we can compare our freshly cut logs and um, are they more successful on those than when they're just put directly in fallen logs in the forest? Um, yes, we're looking at uh, sonic tomography. That might be an option to see, actually get like um, heat maps of how far the fungi has spread, which we can use with our DNA. Um, and of course, we would love to see fruit bodies, but um, people haven't grown these species a lot. It's really hard to predict when they might come out. Our faster species might be within the span of my PhD, two or three years, um, or they might be much, much later. Um, so maybe future funding or my own personal interest will allow me to go out and look for fruit bodies um, because that is the end goal. That would be the, um, the uh, ultimate success <laughs> is that they're fruiting and sporulating and continuing the population themselves. Okay, so then finally, the main outcomes um, is, of course, one is the direct reintroduction of these species, so we will have um, an immediate impact, hopefully, on these seven um, important species that are threatened in Finland. But moreover, um, hopefully, the knowledge and results can lead this research to be applied to other fungal conservation um, around the world, different species, where ethically appropriate and um, all of the considerations I brought up at the beginning. Um, and finally, um, I'll have the information to make cost estimates and guidelines, which can use mycologists, uh, or which can be used by mycologists and researchers and conservationists together with forestry restoration work um, to create kind of a toolbox for collaboration. So that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joette. If you want to stop sharing your screen now. Yes. Um, we can go over to some questions. Uh, again, if people want to post their queries into the chat, that would be really helpful. Um, I, I'd like to kick off, I guess, by being controversial. Um, Great. 
in conservation, there is, I guess, some kickback against, apparently, there's some kickback against, I guess, charismatic megafauna being the main target of a lot of conservation efforts. And you can understand why we want to conserve the lions and the tigers, the elephants, the pandas, and so on. But that requires uh, a program that addresses the whole community, not just those individuals, where you pick seven species and said, these are really important species. Let's put those back to places where they were they used to be, but they're, they aren't there now because of land management changes and things like that. Do you think the strategy is a little bit heavy handed in that respect? Yeah, actually, um, I'm very happy that that was your question, uh, because it's a really wonderful point. Of course, you can't say that seven species out of the hundreds of species of fungi in a forest are the most important or deserve protection more than the rest. Um, I think fungi more than other taxonomic groups really represent the importance of habitat conservation. So this is um, really only to use in uh, connection to habitat. So maybe whatever species are chosen in the area kind of are those representative species that you're talking about. But if you're protecting the forests and you're putting more dead wood, um, that of course opens up more substrate and habitat for the other fungi. So um, it would be ideal if our species survive on those logs, but lots of other ones also have a chance to live in that same wood and have um, succession. So it's a big question, a big topic, yes, um, but I think with uh, fungal conservation being in such um, an infancy stage, any work that we can do to raise um, really the profile on fungal conservation okay, will I've got one, do some one more, good. <laughs> one more question for you from me before I... I go over to the chat questions. And that is really, what is your definition of a rare fungus? Yeah, <laughs> okay, so um, of course, uh, yeah, the red listing has its own criteria that they follow and that's also different by region. Um, as I mentioned, our goal is not ones that are rare and should be rare because that's the vast majority of them. Um, so I'm more focused on ones that are more rare than they were <laughs> a few decades ago. Um, and I think it's, yeah, I think it's hard to define. Like I said, it takes a long history of fungal ecological knowledge of an area. Um, yeah, rare is what might only show up in one DNA test in a whole forest, but that's how it should be <laughs> versus yeah yeah i mean okay i've got a question here from angela she says is is it anti-evolution trying to reintroduce species that are dying out um and her comment is that some fungi are disappearing but others are just being discovered should we focus more on reducing our own population uh impact uh, and adverse effects on the environment rather than trying to protect or reintroduce species Absolutely. Yeah. Um, as said, this is not um, a standalone uh, sort of methodology. And I think that's the most critical aspect to keep in mind. Um, it's also something I've thought about as a conservation researcher for the past 10 years. That's kind of always been my um, key question is to not fight evolution or not think that humans know best, but to allow evolution to happen. Um, I think and that's what, in that way, that's why it's important to consider the genetic diversity. So again, not being too heavy handed, putting out one strain and trying to like force it to continue and only working with ones that you know are reduced because of direct human impact. Um, of course, uh, species are disappearing for a variety of reasons. It could be natural out competition through evolution. Um, you need to know why they're decreasing in the first place. And yeah, to the final point, absolutely. We need to focus the most on habitat conservation. There's no point to reintroduce them if there's not. So, so that links into Peter's question here is that do you think urban or landscape planning schemes could implement some sort of nature channels or other kind of planning to enhance or improve the connections that have been disrupted by deforestation? Yeah, I think that's a, a big goal, at least in my area. I'm speaking mostly from the Nordics, but I know fragmentation is all over the place. Um, I think... Uh, yeah, land planning, however it goes in your local area, these connection corridors are just as important for fungi as they are for a lot of other taxon. 
Um, so having forests, uh, not an old growth forest that is all isolated and surrounded by agriculture, but having it connected to a younger forest, um, to recently protected forest, that again allows them, yeah, to spread and develop and evolve. Okay, so I've got a question here uh, from Peter, which was basically, are you planning to follow up the community structures of these inoculated uh, logs and trees, host trees, to see what impact uh, your introductions might be having on those other species? Yes, at least a little bit in this project. Um, and if anyone here who's familiar with research knows that the funding comes on a step by step basis, we do have that incorporated as much as possible into this project. So we've taken the DNA analysis of all of the logs and the trees before we did reintroductions, and we'll compare that to see how did they change. Of course, that will be mostly um, correlational. So we can't say from that what direct impact our fungi are having. Um, I personally am very interested in the community dynamics as an ecologist, so I would love if more funding comes in the future and we can follow that a little more closely, do direct interaction studies and even expand it to um, beetles and so forth, a lot of species that depend on these fungi. Okay, great, great ambition there. Um, I've got one last personal question, which is about the spread of these reintroductions to other parts of the ecosystem and the forest. You mentioned spore sampling uh, as a way of measuring that. I wondered how you were going to go about that or whether you thought about using homokaryotic uh, mycelia as traps, looking for heterocarotization yeah. and therefore you might be able to get a biological kind of net. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so that's a method that uh, my supervisors and some people in my project have used uh, previously in different projects. Um, Basically, again, it comes to what's the next step? What can we get funding and expand our projects? But it would, in theory, be relatively simple to put the spore samplers at uh, 10 meters, 100 meters, a kilometer from our study sites and try to map that, how far they how far they spread as it increased after this reintroduction work, et cetera. So um, any master students out there, any hopeful people <laughs> to pick up on this work? Yes, that would be very cool to Brilliant. see. Okay, we've got time for one final question, which is from Helen. And I guess this can kind of sum things up a little bit. What do we know about the drivers of decline of those species that you've chosen? Uh, and actually, can we mitigate those those drivers? Yeah, yeah. So that's um, a great question. I would say the um, it's relatively well known um, for fungi that have been red listed. Um, they're in most cases, it's habitat loss. Um, so this is deforestation, mostly. Um, it's the same for the species that we've chosen. And not only deforestation, but they're so um, dependent on special niches, these um, special wood types that take 200, 300 years to form and have been cut down for building saunas in Finland and so forth. Um, so we know that that's the biggest driver for these species. And um, yeah, a lot of uh, policy work and conservationists are working in Finland and Sweden to push the forestry industries to um, leave more dead wood, uh, leave more protected habitats. And that's, yeah, ultimately critical <laughs> for this. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to give you a round of applause as well. I'm sure yeah. everybody in the audience would like to do that as well. Uh, it's been a really informative uh, and entertaining talk as well. So thank you very much, Joette. So uh, now that we're entering the last half an hour of the webinar, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our third and final speaker uh, in this session. Uh, that's Nimsy K.A. Uh, Nimsy is at the Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Studies uh, in India. She completed her bachelor's degree in 2008 and a master's degree in 2010 uh, at the in the microbiology department at Mahatma Gandhi uh, University, Kerala. She's been working as a faculty member of the MES College, Merampali in Kerala for 10 years, uh, from 2011 to 2020, and is currently pursuing her PhD in marine microbiology in the Department of Marine Sciences uh, at Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Studies. Her research focuses on the study of diversity, distribution and bioprospecting of yeasts from the mangrove ecosystem. 
Her research spans from basic aspects of yeast diversity to the applied aspects of environmental protection and sustainability of agriculture. Her work involves the characterization of manglicolous yeasts, particularly those associated with mangrove vegetation. Uh, there's a few words there that I've never said before, so I apologize if I got them wrong, Mimsy. Uh, but the title of her talk is Yeast uh, from Mangrove Ecosystems. So if you'd like to share your screen uh, and begin your presentation. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thank you for your nice introduction. okay that's great okay okay thank you mark uh today i'm honored to be here to deliver a talk on studying east in indian macros actually i have been doing my research on yeast diversity from macro ecosystems from indian macros that is mainly located in kerala in the last three years when I started my research career, I have no too much of uh, knowledge about the yeast. But when while working, I was interested or I interested with the fascinating world on yeast and uh, with their versatile colors and their smell and their biotic potentials. So I also thank my investigator, Dr. K. Manjusha, for giving me such an opportunity to work under her team east from Indian mangroves, mainly from Kerala. So our university also, they situated in the east west coast of India. So it, it surrounded by a good natural patches of mangroves and many government funds are there to conserving these mangroves and our campus is surrounded with a heterogeneous group of mangrove ecosystem. So first we have to know about the macro forests. We all know they are uh, salt tolerant, medium heighted trees or shrubs inhabited in the tropical and subtropical region. And they got many numerous benefits like carbon sequestration and they protect against natural disasters like hurricanes and tsunamis. And also they are a habitat for various marine lives and they're very complex root network system that help for feeding habitat for crabs and it is a nesting habitat for various migratory birds and also hotspot for various microorganisms. But the one thing is this uh, ecosystem, this marine ecosystem, they are present in harsh or fluctuation environmental conditions. So if any microorganism that inhabited in this condition also have some adaptive mechanisms by producing certain bioactive compounds. These plants also having some adaptive mechanisms like uh, salt secreting outside from the leaves and also they having very broad network of fruits for holding the soil tight and they having pneumatophores for capturing the oxygen from outside when the oxygen is limited and they have some roots they are hanging from the branch for their support and uh, breathing pores on their box and their seeds. They are hanging from the branch and they, when they detach it, they are entered directly to water and they are germinated. And their flowers, they are very attractive for insects for the pollination. So these are some of the adaptive mechanisms for these plants to survive in the harsh environmental conditions. So the microbiota, including yeast that inhabited in this condition also have some adaptive mechanisms by producing certain biotic compounds, these makes uh, are essentials of this study in future. By considering the global distribution, the macros are found or uh, they are distributed in every continent except the poles and the macros over 100 countries, the largest macros in India, Australia and Brazil and Indian macros also got an attention because 6.8% of the world macro cover was uh, in India. But 
human activities uh, it causing some deforestation and threats by farming aquaculture climate changes commercialization they threats this ecosystem but our government in 2023 introduced one scheme to protect this mangrove ecosystem along the indian coast why this indian mangroves got more attention is because the world's large two world's large two mangrove ecosystems are situated in the uh, indian mangroves some of species that present the mangrove species present in india they are rhizophora and uh, avicennia candelia bulgaria these are the some uh, mangroves that present in the india and indian mangroves are mainly heterogeneous in nature mainly in kerala this is because of the human activities, developmental activities. These are very fastly disappearing ecosystem from our environment. So our study also pointing out uh, the conservation of this mangrove ecosystem for future too. So then when we enter into Manglicolus East, what do you mean by the Manglicolus East? We all know about the Secaromyces cerevisiae and also the Candida albicans. But what do you mean by Manglicolus East? One of our paper is published in FEMS about the diversity, distribution and bioprospecting potentials of this Manglicolus East. Actually, my the macro ecosystem that is a, a hotspot for various microbiotas, including uh, bacteria, uh, protozoa, algae, and fungi, including yeast, is inhabited in these ecosystems are called as Manglicolus yeast, and they are polyphyletic group of ascomycotic and basidiomycotic fungi. And by considering their morphological characters, they are very, very uh, versatile because uh, of its colors. They are, some of them are pigmented and they are oval in shape or round in shape. Some are individual cells. When we look through the microscope, some are attached to form hyphae. So some forming pseudo hyphae or true hyphae. So these are for using their morphological identification of the yeast. And from the mangrove ecosystem, we can collect the samples by, uh, we can collect the samples like water, sediments, or plant parts for the isolation of the yeast because they are associated with the mangrove plants uh, in different plant parts and sediments and water, uh, and also the invertebrates inhabited in this ecosystem too. So, and the culture dependent and independent methods can be used to understanding this manglicolus is we introduced or we uh, used some isolation uh, uh, conventional isolation methods like serial dilution and after plating we identified with morphological characters and done by biochemical characteristics and after that we done the molecular identification but there are some um, metagenomic analysis is there but one of the limitation is that the high amount of the polysaccharides and polyphenols and other secondary metabolites present in the mangrove plants that can impact the total DNA extractions. So these are the limitations of the study and this calls for more research in this direction too. By considering the world mangro, uh, manglicolus yeast distribution, the studies are reported from Asia and America and Europe, no reports from the Africa. And some of the species like Antida, Rhodoptorula, and Cryptococcus, they have cosmopolitan distribution. They present um, in, uh, in every uh, whatever, um, uh, in every continent, and also with regardless to their uh, isolation uh, samples or their region uh, or whatever it may be. But some species, they are particular to particular region or particular plants or particular invertebrates like that. But in Asia, their studies are limited to India, Thailand, and uh, Taiwan, Philippines, Pakistan, China, and Saudi Arabia. But in uh, Asia, it's very limited studies are there in Pichavaram, Sundarban. These are the two world's largest mangrove stations and also in Goa and Kerala. So we selected Kerala for our study because our campus having very heterogeneous group of mangroves and 13 varieties of mangrove species are there. And... Uh, uh, so uh, we are selected the study uh, in our campus and we found um, 215 isolates from our campus, east isolate from our campus and we 
identified biochemically, microscopically, biochemically, and molecularly. We identified and we got 21 genera and 45 species of mancolicola seized from our sampling stations. And some of the species, they are particularly for the leaves and some are from uh, particularly for barks and flowers, stem, sediments and root. Some having cosmopolitan in distribution and some uh, species, they are particularly uh, for uh, distributed in or associated with that plant part uh, only. So that's because of their, uh, that may be because of their nutrient acquisition or their relations like symbiotic, uh, uh, mutualistic or uh, parasitic or interactions like that. So why these manclicolous yeast are important is because of their bioprospecting potentials. And for uh, uh, for existing this adverse conditions, this manclicolous yeast having certain potential to produce bioactive compounds like some enzymes, uh, then uh, biofuels or biosurfactants, some antimicrobial compounds and bio bioremediation tools and single cell proteins, uh, etc. So uh, in our study, we included the pigmented yeast and by using the pigmented yeast, we can we prepare our uh, feed for the ornamental fish quicker. And we uh, published one paper uh, about the uh, color enhancement of the ornamental fishes with the, using the colorated red, red pigmented yeast Rhodoptor lapal regina in our lab. So in case of our uh, uh, aquaculture system, all the fishes were in very uh, constrained or strained situations. So they have a chance to lose their colors. So by incorporating their feeds with their colors, it can enhance the uh, ornamental fishes uh, color. And these are also uh, doing in our laboratory plant growth promotion by yeast. Um, the plant, we know the yeast are grass trees, generally recognized as seed. So we can use it as a fertilizer. Uh, some of the yeast species, they're having phytobeneficial traits for plant growth promotion, like ammonia production, nitrate production, or phosphate solubilization, uh, like that, IAA production, like that. So these strains individually or as by producing a consortium we can use in our environment for plant growth promotion for sustainable environment and development. So in our laboratory we also practicing preparation of a consortium uh, for the plant growth development uh, for the crop plants and as well as to the mangrove plants, mangrove seedlings for their conservation tool and three of our paper is published uh, in this area too. And these also, we are working on these themes too, uh, this application too in our laboratory uh, for giving aroma and color to the food. And also by the polysaccharide beta glucan produced from the yeast can replace uh, the sugar content from uh, production of biscuits for the uh, diabetic patients. So these are undergoing uh, projects in our laboratory. And bioremediation, the oil, crude oil contaminated areas, we can use the uh, lipolytic uh, yeast forms or the biosurfactant produced from the yeast uh, are, can be used as a remediation for to degrade this crude oil from the crude oil contaminated areas. These are also working in our laboratory. And some of these yeast, they are, can uh, ferment the various sugars and produce ethanol. So it is an alternative for uh, fuel consumption. And some of the compounds, biotic compounds, they, are, uh, they can act as antibiotics and can act as an anti-cancer agents like biosurfactant from the uh, yeast species that can be used or in various studies reported, they have uh, anti-cancer or antibiotic activities. Many of the uh, yeast isolator, they are they can produce various type of enzymes like uh, amylase, lipase, uh, cellulase, chitinase, uh, different type of enzyme that is uh, for their nutritional acquisition strategy. So these enzymes so that can be used for various industries uh, applications like textile, biofuel, and uh, all in a food and uh, other industries too. So this, I conclude my topic is the macros. Uh, this is a treasure route uh, for various untapped microorganisms, including yeast. 
uh, so the conservation is very important um, because these uh, are this ecosystem is very fast disappearing ecosystem from our environment thank you Thank you very much, Nimsey. Again, a, a brilliant talk. And as someone who has now worked on yeast in two forms as Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Candida albicans for the last 25 years, um, I've been very much brought up on the phrase, the awesome power of yeast molecular genetics. And I think you've just highlighted the awesome power of yeast uh, in its entirety. So uh, well done. Thank you very much for that. Uh, again, can the audience please post any questions that they might have for Nimsy into the chat? And I'll uh, come to those in a moment. Um, the thing that struck me in your list of species that you find, your mangalicus uh, yeasts, it's my new favourite word, that, um, was the number of species which are linked to human disease so candida albicans candida tropicalis the cryptococcus um i didn't see candida auris on there but you, maybe you could tell me if it is on on that list um do you find that surprising um actually uh we got uh, candida albicans from the pl plants we isolated candida albicans from plants but uh, the thing is that the strains that present in the terrestrial ecosystem or we isolated from the other ecosystems are different from the Manclicolus yeast. They are particularly associated with macros. So some of these are, they have no pathogenic genes inside them. They are strain that, re, that is uh, very uh, much related to or very much closely to uh, Canada albicans or uh, pathogenic strains. But we isolated, but uh, the strains that is not to, not identical to the pathogenic strains. So that all makes me more interested in this area. And uh, the limitations of this uh, study is the identification. We know that it is dimorphic in nature. So we can't identify whether it is a fungi or yeast. So that is the main part. And we also notice that in case of metagenomic studies are there for identifying various uh, diversities of from uh, of microbiota from various environmental samples but in case of yeast that is not possible because uh, we are using ITS region sequencing uh, for fungus and yeast so both will be amplified so filtering the yeast from that is very difficult for us uh, and also the taxonomic changes that makes me more difficult in my study um, so that are the limitations uh, I faced in uh, my <laughs> study <laughs> okay I think that's probably a topic for a, an entirely different seminar or another evening uh, about taxonomic uh, changes um, you mentioned the fact there are lots of different mangrove species around the world have you got any idea how the individual hosts affect the the community of yeast that are present uh yeah because in our study we use in 13 mangrove plant species some uh, they have different association or the yeast have different association with the, these plants that's because some plants are having certain compounds that can attract or that can associate the yeast uh, in the plants and we are not concentrating the endophytic fungi we concentrate endophytic yeast we concentrating all yeast associated with the plant so we can't sure it is not from the air or it is not from the uh, uh, water droplets we can't uh, sure that but they are associated in macros and we identified uh, regularly the presence of that organism in that species so uh, we are identifying their association and interaction of this species uh, the work is going on sir brilliant and do you have any evidence for yeast communities are there specific associations between species do, do, do they often co-occur um wants or to are identify they, or are they that? independent i suppose uh, uh pardon, sir uh, last so are are there unique 
associations between different yeast species that would imply that they are part of a a community on the mangroves or do you just have a random distribution of these species amongst your mm -hmm. isolates oh uh, no sir we uh, we identified in which part the organism is concentrating roots or leaves or flowers so these organisms are associated with some parts or uh, some uh, like in flowers or root that is for particular functions. Like they have some enzymes for inhabiting in that particular region. Uh, they can produce certain uh, traits, phytobeneficial traits for growth promotions and to inhibit phytopathogens too, sir. So that may be the relation, uh, beneficial relation. Uh, they having some beneficial relations with the plants. One, one thing I did notice from one of your figures was that the number of yeast you isolated from flowers was much lower yeah. uh, than maybe other parts of the plants. Now, is that is that just a matter of timing and reduced sampling level compared with other parts of the, the trees? Uh, because the flowering uh, that uh, we can collect the leaves, barks and roots uh, from every season. But uh, the flowers that is very limited and uh, also the salinity level is uh, very uh, different from other plant, other parts of the plant. So that can in, uh, influence the presence of yeast in uh, flowers. Okay. And I, I, again, related to that, have you specifically looked at nectaries within the flowers, which would be a very sugar rich environment and would perhaps select for certain types of, of yeast. Maybe. Maybe, something for the future. Okay, yeah. let's have a quick look at, at the chat. Um, fantastic talk, thank you very much from Becky. And uh, Jane says that she's learnt a lot. And Gemma says, I wasn't aware of how many different areas yeast could be involved in. Uh, and thank you. I think you gave us a, a great primer of fungal biotechnology and yeast biotechnology uh, this evening. So thank you very much. Um, I don't think there are any more questions in the chat, but what we could do now is if we can get everybody back on screen. Brilliant. So I, I'd just like to conclude by thanking all of our speakers uh, tonight. They've all done a wonderful job. And I think they've really enforced the message about the important role of communities within fungal systems and whether that's a, the, the fungal fungal interaction community or the fungal plant uh, interaction community. So I would like to give them all a round of applause and uh, thank you and also the audience for all of their questions this evening. Um, so thank you to everyone. I think we'll call it a, the end of the day there.